welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra. Imagine being asked to take charge of one of the bloodiest prisons in America, where prisoners had to sleep in shifts to watch each other's backs just to stay alive. Well, today's guest fell into such a challenge and became committed to changing the reputation of Angola Prison. Hear how he today on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and my guest today is Burl Kane, prison warden of the Louisiana State Penitentiary, also known as Angola. And he is subject of this book, Kane's Redemption, a story of hope and transformation in America's bloodiest prison by Dennis Shear. Welcome, Burl. Well, glad to be here. It is great to have you here and to actually talk to a person who is on the front line of prison work. And what did you think when you got the job for Angola Prison? I didn't want the job. You didn't want the job? No. They said, just do it for a little bit. Yeah, you go back to the old job. So I did, but then I got kind of into it and it and it really, I knew what it was. And I knew that about five years, you would lose control of it again. And then you would have the wreck you're going to have, some kind of really bad violence, and then you're going to get fired because wardens are paid fall guys. That's what we are. And so, therefore, I, didn't, I was too young to retire. So I knew my time wasn't going to work right with the graft. You know, I wasn't right. going to be ready at the time. Right. So anyway, uh, we had the first execution. And uh, with that, it had a profound impact on my life because we didn't do it really the way I thought we should have when it was all over. And uh, that's what made me stay. How long were you on the job with the first execution? Oh, it was about four months. And what was wrong with what happened? I just didn't do it right. You know, the, I was the last person in this room with this guy while he was alive. And then I looked at him dead and and uh, we put him there. And uh, you might be bl blunt about it and say we killed him. Right. And then the way that I, I did the deal, I just didn't do it properly, I was kind of ashamed the way I handled it, you know, myself, without the dignity it should have had. And uh, we're, I'm not an oppressive person. And so that's how we really ran a prison. I'm kind of moving you on to there, but not being oppressive. And I was more like the oppressive person in the execution. So you kind of did it by the book or uh, it didn't have that heart and soul that you wanted to bring into that moment. To be blunt about it, we were just kind of macho about it. Okay. You know, just yeah. you thugs like. Right. And that wasn't, that's kind of the way it had been in the past, but but I went there to change Angola, not to let it change me, and I let it change me. What did, when did you want to change Angola? When did you get that burning desire to say it could be different, it could be better? Well, when I first got there, I realized the only way to change the place was to get the place to be moral. Right. And uh, then you go to rehabilitation right there, and I suddenly I realized that that the only true rehabilitation is moral rehabilitation. And so moral people don't rape, pilfer, and steal. Right. These are real basic things that I realize, and I, I prayed for wisdom. That's the one thing I'd pray for to God. I look at this guy and say, Lord, give me wisdom. I just pray for wisdom. I, I gotta get through this place. The, the weapon of choice was a lock in a sock to go beat you in the head and right. beat your eyes out and so forth. And, uh, and so just a very violent place every week, and it was just too much violence. Somebody's going to get killed, right. about four murders, and you're really in trouble yourself as a warden, or about four escapes, or about four suicides. And so we were just struggling through all this, and we just had to change the prison. So the first program we did was Experiencing God with Henry Blackaby. Right. And uh, we had done it in my Sunday school. And so we just brought that Sunday school class, Dan Golan did the Experiencing God, and we involved about 80 inmates. And that was our nucleus. We and were so off that and running, and I didn't even realize it. You didn't even realize it. You no. didn't even know. You just you just had a problem on I'm your desperate. hands, and you had to have a something to happen. Something. And that was the that was the little nucleus that that made it work. How how strong was the Christian emphasis in Angola before you came? Were, were there well, chapels or churches there? There was one little chapel, and uh, there was a Catholic church for the free people. Okay. And what does that mean? That's the people who aren't inmates. Because uh, there's a little city around the prison, right? And are you talking about those folks that uh, live within the confines of the prison property? There's about 500 or 600 people that live inside the prison, children 
And uh, I say we live in a gated community, and our gate guard has a real gun. <laughs> and uh, the school bus comes in, the garbage truck comes in, we have a swimming pool, a lot of activities for the children, baseball parks, and so forth. These are all employees of the prison. Right. But not the children, but the employees' children. The employees children, live right. there, and so that's because we'll have a reserve force if we had any event that we needed extra help. And to have them there, we built, the little city was built there. We also have our post office. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so there was a Catholic church there. That's right. And, and a little tiny all. chapel within the uh, more within of those prison, prison structure, right? Seated about 140 people. Okay. And that's all. So it was it wow. was a, it was an ungodly place. Now there was some inmates there that had been praying for years. They tell me for deliverance. I really and truly believe he healed their land. And that's the same group that we started in the Bible college, which came along not too long afterward, which was another fluke. A fluke? Oh, I couldn't. I didn't. I would have never dreamed of that. How I did that get smart. started? It just fell on my lap. We lost Pell Grants in 95, remember? Mm -hmm, so did. inmates couldn't have higher education. Being an educator, I wanted education. And so I knew that would help because education brings you out of darkness to light. And so, and so anyway, the average, the average uh, grade level there was about the fifth grade. So we needed to have higher education for those that got their GEDs to continue on. And uh, I'm sitting around a table and a guy from the Judson Baptist Association and a professor from LSU that was a Christian, and I'm complaining about no higher education. They said, well, why don't we bring the Bible college here? And I said, you lost your mind. He'll never come here. <laughs> so that would be like, you know, just, I just couldn't believe that. Right. So they said, oh yeah, they'll come. I believe they'll come. So they, we'll go. If you get them, I'll let them come. They can come. And so uh, they did. That's really what changed the culture of the prison with the Bible college. And I'm a real proponent of that throughout the country. Now we have the Bible college in Mississippi. We have it in Georgia and South Carolina. And it's patterned after the way we did it. We keep the separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. And uh, the prisons are less violent. And that means less victims of right. violent crime. And that's really what we really need to think about. So how do you keep that separation of church and state when you've, you've got a lot of activities that have to do with faith, and yet, obviously, this is a governmental organization. Well, it's not about the faith as much as it is about the money. And uh, okay. we have to keep the, the, the Bible College, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, does not want, nor will they take, any tax dollars in their program because they want to keep their separation, too. Okay. So that makes it real cool. So we hire one guy that's going to be the liaison between us and them, and then that's it. And so they don't, the taxpayers really reap a great benefit because they get higher education in the prison free. So that's really pretty cool. And the inmates are actually choosing. You're not making them go to seminary. You're not making them they take Bible. Go. They, they just, want to go. They want to go really bad. And then the other thing the seminary does, it doesn't really look at what religion you are or any religion. It determines if you can qualify academically and then you have to have a good, a good record. You can't be a violent inmate in prison and go to the Bible college. You have to not have the write-ups, and so that's So good. this allows a lifer to have something to work for, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, we've graduated. We'll have another graduation this spring, and that's going to put us close to 200 four-year preachers graduated with full degrees, just like LSU, you know, accredited the same, just like Calvin College. And so that's really important because if you have that many preachers walking around starting Bible classes and being inmate lawyers and being tutors and and other teachers and doing other jobs in the prison, then you're going to have a moral place. There's a book called The Tipping Point, where it says if you just get enough people going in one direction, you can actually change the whole uh, s character of a well, that's place. that's what happened. And that's what happened here. It is. Now, there was another, another thing we did, is we had to move the free people, the security staff, the same direction. They had to become, they had to, be, they had to stay strong and maintain custody and control but they had to become unoppressive. And so we're not oppressive. We don't, we don't curse. Nobody curses. Inmates are not free people. If you curse, you get in real trouble. Okay, you get because, written up? Oh yeah. Now this has got to be a big change for the people who've come into prison and probably well, prison staff too. It's just like if, if, if two people are cursing, they're real close to fighting. If you can keep them from cursing, they're just a little further away from the violence. So if we don't curse, we're less violent because we're not going to be calling each other really bad names that says, okay, you do, you, you, my honor is at stake here and I'm going to slap the fire out of you. Right. You know, so, so just to be blunt about it, so yeah. the cursing was really good for us too. Right. 
because the free people, you know, the 1,700 employees I had at the time, that was pretty hard to keep peace and harmony there as well. Did everybody buy into this right away, or did you? how did you sell people on this? I mean, did you look like the soft warden, and all the people who were there before <clears> you came said, hey, look, he doesn't know what he's doing. I, we know how to keep control of this place, and he's just... Well, this wasn't a democracy. <laughs> and so you either caught the train or you caught the gate. I see. And so, and I had to come across that strong with it because it was the right thing to do. There's no, diff there's no one can argue with what we were doing because we were, we were seeking morality and moral rehabilitation. We weren't re seeking really God as far as on the surface as it would seem. But in our culture, <clears throat> we find morality in religion more than anywhere else, especially in the South. I don't know about here, but down there, you know, that's where you're going to find morality. If you don't have it, find it in religion. Right. That doesn't mean that people who are atheists aren't moral. Doesn't mean that people who are other religions aren't moral. You know, I've read enough about Buddhism and, and, and Muslims and so forth that they perpetuate morality as well. So we didn't really care what religion you were. But still in all, the dominant religion was Bapticostal. Bapticostal? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's that a special kind of, kind of thing Baptist down in Louisiana. Thing, yeah. <laughs> and so, in fact, in prison, and that's the culture because it's primarily black, about 75% black, and that changes on death row, though. Oh. It'd be more white, higher percentage of white, but not more white. And so anyway, uh, so that was okay, too. And the other thing was, with the Bible college, all the churches were involved. The Louisiana Baptist Convention was given the money to pay for the, the Bible college, and so we got the community involved big time. And so the politicians had to kind of stay back because you didn't want to make all these church people really mad at you. So there was sort of a, a nice balance of yeah. interest. You had your churches, you had your politicians, and things were working, things were getting better. Well, they, everybody, it's what I learned, I felt, I've kind of learned this about the public and dealing with prisons. They're afraid of them. They don't want to be around them. They want them to be punished pretty much, but they do care about their soul. And they, don't, they want them to go to heaven. Nobody wants people just to go to hell. No, they don't. Everybody wants people that are moral people or Christian people that believe in heaven. They want them to go to heaven. That's right. Well, let's watch and see a little bit about the place that you work okay. in every day. Well, I'm on my way, Lord, to the kingdom land. Will the dumb sign no made up in my mind? Well, I'm on my way, oh Lord, I'm on my way, on my way. Angola, average sentence 88 years. It's the largest maximum security prison in America. 90% of the inmates would die here. One out of every two is a murderer. Oh, this place was a nightmare. I caught the tail into some really ugly situations. I mean, it was, it was bloody, it was messy. And, you know, guys would pair up. It's like, you know, I'd sleep half a night and you'd sleep half a night. And if I woke up, used a bathroom, and you fell asleep, I was uh, obligated to make a hole in you because you, you, you would have allowed me to die. You slept on your watch. And, I mean, this place was a nightmare. Oh, mama, this is a cold place. This is a place once without hope at one time. You couldn't hardly get missionaries to come in here. They were scared. Angola was thrown away. This was a thrown away place. It was dangerous. Down the line, God had a plan. And he had chosen a man by the name of Warden Burr came. And he came with a vision. He came with a vision for this place and for such a time as this. Oh, the preacher's preaching. And the deacon's morning. And the sister's praying. Oh, the church on fire with the word of God. Is this the Angola bloody prison in America? This can't be it. But my brothers and my sisters, in fact, it is. So 
So you want these folks to build a community so that the place that they're living in matters to them. We do, yes, they have to. They have to have hope, they have to have structure. And they, to live your life, you just can't live it in the cell torment because you'll finally it just, you know, we do that to some people. Some people have to stay in the cell, but and it's sad. But we want to leave the light at the end of the tunnel so that if they ever change or they want to change, that they can change, and many of them do. So you, you have uh, supervision over 18,000 acres. It's a working farm. You have a $120 million budget. And you have a lot of activities going on for these men in this prison. And that has grown under your leadership. How did you grow that? The workshop, the radio, the radio station, the, uh, you have a magazine that comes out. Why do you do that all? I also have a television station. You have now. a television station. <laughs> I do, and it's a pretty cool one. And uh, we have televangelists because it's inmates preaching. Our, we have seven churches now. The largest one seats 800. And uh, the, you always can see a church steeple anywhere on his farm. And so they preach in their own churches, they do their own congregations, and we televise their sermons to the entire population so the ones in the cell blocks can be involved too. Otherwise, they couldn't, they wouldn't be evangelized. So if you're in a cell block, you can't go to church uh, like the people who are in the dormitories? Right. Okay. Sometime we'll have just cell block church but we have to deal with enemies and so forth. And we don't know really who's converted and who's not in many cases, but we want to expose them all to the moral rehabilitation as we would education as well. So we use this television station to have the learning channel. And you have a requirement, an expectation for good citizenship in your prison. What does that look like actually? Well, we have, it's really back to community. The, uh, the dormitory is the city, the bed is the house, and the uh, aisle is the street, and three beds down is three doors down. Go visit with your neighbor and go be with him when he's mourning, go be with him when he's sick. And then the church, there's going to be a preacher in most every dormitory and every congregation can work with, and, and the congregations are dispersed throughout the prison. Some moral person can be with you if your family member dies or if you tr you're having a problem or you can't get along or you feel like you're being mistreated, then there's someone to counsel with you and come and, and, be, and, be, and be with you and befriend you rather than someone to just glare at you and say, oh, man, toughen up and so forth. Well, you actually address the loneliness of your prisoners, don't you? We do, and we, and we also leave the light at the end of the tunnel with the hospice program. Yes. And we learn that, that when they really change their lives and when people really give their souls to God and so forth, they want to do two things. One, they want to say they're sorry to the victim. Okay. And the other, they want to do something to help other people. They want to give back because the opposite of selfish is giving back. So when you're rehabilitated, you're not selfish anymore. You want to do things for other people. And we have to have mechanisms so they can do that. And that actually gives purpose to life. That's really the big deal. Right. That's when you can do the time. And that's when you can give it to God. Right. And, and that's what's really great when you see that. In the hospice program, you... I saw a hospice program in another prison and you said, I want that in my prison, and they no. said, you can't? No, I saw the hospice in the newspaper on <laughs> okay. Sunday morning. And uh, there was only one of the hospice, it turns out, at the federal prison in Springfield. We were the only prison with hospice in a, a state prison in the country. And now they come from all over to see the hospice, but it made sense to me. Again, the common sense thing was, we're treating all these inmates with the same doctors and nurses and so, therefore, if we want to have a hospice program, we're going to still have the same number of inmates. We're just going to treat them a different way. So why do I need more doctors and nurses? I don't think I did, and I didn't. And so I told them, we're going to have hospice. I'm not going to give you any money, and you're going to have the best hospice there is right. in a year, which we were the only one. All we had to do was beat the one at Springfield, right. and we'd be the best. Yes. And so we did. And you like being the best. I like being first. Okay. You know, because we want to, we, we're overachievers. At, at Angola. Yeah, in my life, I always want to be the overachiever because I, used to, it, I want to get there. You know, I want it's, it can't be done. We want to do it. And not only that, you, you have uh, exceeded the warden's length of time at Angola by double, haven't you? I just made 15 years. All right. Do you think that there are men in Angola who should be released? Oh, yeah. I said that to the public. The Criminal Justice Committee came to Angola and uh, we talked about you know, rehabilitation, and we don't have hearings for these people. Charles Manson gets a hearing. Right. We don't have that in Louisiana. And uh, I told them that it probably 250, 300, I could let go that would never hurt you again, just off, just like that. Right. And But they have the life sentences, and you have to remember the victims. And I think victims trump, and I don't want anyone to go that someone has to be afraid of. 
And therefore, we have to really work hard at inmate victim reconciliation, which we're doing, which is one of the most wonderful things I've ever seen, is when the victim's family gets up and comes around the table and hugs the guy that killed her son yes. or killed a family right. member and forgives him. Right. But he has to be worthy. He has to be worthy. You speak a lot about forgiveness, and your prisoners speak a lot about forgiveness, we do, don't they? Because that's what's important. Right. They need to be forgiven, but we have to forgive to be forgiven, and uh, we need to remember that in the Bible. But we're mortal and moral and mortal people, and sometimes we just can. And I understand that. Right, and you have in this prison, as as good as it sounds, and as redemptive as it sounds, you still have death row and you still have solitary confinement and you still have the lock cells and the dormitories. There's these stages. What keeps people like the Angola Three in solitary confinement? They live 30 years ago. Okay. They won't move on to the future. They still want to believe in the past and the issues they had is the black and white and they're still back there and this, this country has moved so far past that but they can't get past it. You know, they were in solitary before you came. They were. And how can you move them out? Do you ever speak to them? I know some, I, a couple I of do, them already I can, have. and I, I, I'm, I tr you have the problem with that they, they're convicted twice of killing the correctional officer okay. and stabbing him. Therefore, it means they don't respect, expect the blue uniform. So therefore, if the issue got to be with them that it was problematic, the blue uniform, they might do it again, okay, because he did it once. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you don't really want to give them the freedom to, to live with the, in the dormitory because there's a little girl that's 19 or 20 years old that's guarding this dormitory full of men, and uh, she could be a victim. So that's part of it, and the other part of it, one of them just keeps on doing devious things, okay. you know, and, and he doesn't just really get up front and do right. You talk that some of the prisoners will always be predators. Some people have an opportunity to change their lives, but you've also seen people who just seem stuck. Yeah, it's like fish. We can't catch them all. Right. And so we dilute them, those, to the point that our security is more effective on those who are not, who don't change. But you always hope they do because I've seen the worst, the very worst, and uh, Greg Zumwalt wouldn't mind me saying, but the guy you saw on the mm -hmm. television, he either had to change or he was going to get really bad because he's doing the life sentence for murder, and he found relief in God, and he changed. But he could have been a really dangerous person. He's cool, and he's an inspiration to others, and new ones coming in and so forth. Do you think there should be expanded hearings for a person like that so that there could be an opportunity for for a uh, the civil courts to hear his case and maybe make a different decision? Or is he stuck? No, but there's another component that has to happen. You can't just open the prison gate and say, bye, see you later. Okay. You have to have aftercare, and you have to have effective aftercare. And the aftercare should really come from the churches and church community because, you know, who else is going to do it? And he has to have a job. He has to have a way to get to work. He has to have a place to live. And he has to be cared for. And he has to be mentored and taught how to manage his money and so forth and a friend. So he has to have the friend in the church. But so many churches are just Sunday country club. They go to church Sunday morning. They go home and they don't come back till next Sunday. And they, it's, this is, they don't think about this. Right. But we really have to do our job is in the church as to help the community. And, and, and rescue the perishing. We sing that song. You bring the church and other folks to the prison. Uh, one big way is this rodeo that you have. You have tens of thousands of people coming in and seeing this whole flank of prisoners watching the rodeo, and you're trying to get a message across to the people who visit. Well, first I told the inmate, I'll bring the people to see you, but you have to be worthy because they're afraid of you, and they think you have horns and a forked tail. If you're a prisoner. If you're a prisoner. You're evil and you're a devil. Right. And so you guys show them you're not. Okay, we're going to show them we're not. If you bring the people, we're going to be good. I'm okay. going to show you that. We're going to be good. Okay. Right. That's cool. So we're on the way to rehabilitation right here. And so that's good. And that, they did. And so they that, are their brother's keeper. Because I've had an inmate come tell me there's one sitting in the stand with his family. And so that could have mean he was going to escape. But the other inmates are watching each other. Because they know their privileges could be infected oh, yeah. by that. Like that. Now, how did you get away from the, they ratted them out then? I mean, We don't use that word. Okay, why not? Because, if the rat word we can't say. Because if you have someone dealing drugs on a corner of your street and you don't call the police, you're a bad citizen. A good citizen calls the police. So if you see someone doing something really bad in prison and you don't call the authorities, then you're not rehabilitated. 
because that's not ratting, that's being a good citizen. And you have to be, as the warden, willing to take away things that a majority of your prisoners are actually living rightly about. So if, if for instance, if that prisoner uh, stayed in the stands with his family instead of being where he's supposed to be, those prisoners know that you as a warden might say, hey, you're not going to go to the rodeo. But I didn't take it from him. He gave it back. He gave it back. Yeah, because he had the privilege. He gave it back. It's like when you, it's in this book, when your child's driving fast, don't take the car. He gives you the car. Right. And if they take, if they misuse the microwave or misuse the athletic equipment. They didn't want it anymore. Right. That's not my problem. I wish you would have kept it. I didn't want it. I don't need the microwave. Right. You know, I don't need your television. Right. Why didn't you agree on what you're going to watch instead right. of fight over it? So, in fact, you have made the policing of the inside of your prison do uh, to the inmates. You've said, look, you got to police yourself. We can't have that many guards. Yeah, we let's don't have that many, you know. Right. And this is like the land of new beginnings. We press on to the future, we can't change the past. And we can't, so we don't look behind, we look forward. And in life, we all need to do that. You know, we need to be more forgiving of our families and friends and so forth, because you can't change the mistakes people make. We just make mistakes. We just can't help it. We just have to have forgiveness and grace. And why not in prison? My guest today has been Burl Kane, prison warden of the Louisiana State Penitentiary. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and thank you for watching Inner Compass.